when four disciples came to Jesus, um, for a, he, they, he, uh, Jesus gave them a confidential briefing on a second coming. In fact, it follows right on the heels of the, the, tri- the uh, purpose and uh, tragedy and triumph of history passage. At the end of chapter 23, we come to Matthew 24, and we have this uh, uh, presentation on the, on the end times in which Jesus points them to Daniel 9, the fabled uh, prophecy that Gabriel gave Daniel in chapter 9, the famous 70 weeks. The 69 of those weeks are the most amazing passage in the entire scripture, where Gabriel says, from the commandment restored unto, uh, restored Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the king will be a specific period of time that turns out to be 173,880 days. We know the decree of Artaxerxes that was the commandment restored the city of Jerusalem. And if you go through the arithmetic, it's astonishing. You come to the exact day that the triumphal entry took place on April 6th of 32 AD. Gabriel's margin for error was zero because it's exactly 173,880 days between them. And that's this area that I'm, I'm assuming is review for you because it's the it's a, a most astonishing passage in the Bible because it was translated into Greek three centuries before the gospel period in the Septuagint version. And that's, it constitutes one of the most dramatic demonstrations that the Word of God is really the Word of God. After the 69, there's an interval before the 70th start. It's called verse 26. If it wasn't so express, we would assume they're all contiguous. But clearly, verse 26 comes after the 69, but prior to the 70th. And in, and in that interval, Christ is crucified. The city of Jerusalem is destroyed. That took 30, That's 38 years worth, but we know we've experienced that it's gone all better part of 2000. And, but it's this last week the so-called 70th week, the missing week, the final week of the, of the prophecy from Gabriel that is the focus of our eschatological studies in many, many ways. So we'll zero in on this for a minute. If you look at it on the total timeline from the creation through, we have the fullness of the Gentile start with the church. That's a term Paul uses of the church. Not to be confused with the times of the Gentiles, which is the beginning of Gentile dominion, starting with Nebuchadnezzar and climaxes with the final world leader. So don't confuse those two terms as we go here. But after the the, the, the church is taken out, there's a great tribulation period and uh, in which the church, the church is raptured. And when God, when Christ comes back, he sets up the kingdom. We'll take a look at this a little more closely here. We have the, the 70th week is defined by this covenant being enforced by this world leader. In the middle of that seven-year period, he violates that treaty or that covenant and sets up himself up to be worshipped. And there's a great deal about that. We won't try to build it all here. There should be review for you. But the important part is that both halves of that seven-year period are the most documented period of time in the Bible, in the Old Testament and the New. It is spoken of as three and a half years, 42 months, 1260 days. The Holy Spirit has really made it very clear. There's no way to allegorize that. It's very express, very definitive. Now, the last half of that seven-year period, it's three and a half years, is labeled by Jesus himself as the Great Tribulation in Matthew 24, verse 15. Now, as we get into this, we want, we're going to be focusing here on the events here because the harpazo occurs prior to that 70th week. That 70th week is defined by a treaty of this world leader. The world leader has to be in power in order to enforce that treaty. In order to be in power, he has to be revealed. So there's an interval of time. We don't know how long it is between the... He, he can't be revealed until the rapture takes place, according to Paul in 2 Thessalonians 2. So if uh, so, the sequence is the Harpazza takes place, the, this world leader is revealed, rises to power, and enforces a treaty. What interval that is, is that an hour or is it 30 years? We have no idea. But anyway, the Harpazza is the triggering event from our point of view, because hopefully, if you're in Christ, you will be with him. And... Uh, but down on, down on the earth, we've got uh, the 70th week, uh, the, these things take place, the Great Tribulation, which climaxes in the Battle of Armageddon, in which the Lord intervenes in a second coming and sets up his kingdom for a thousand years, according to Revelation uh, 20. There's a sheep and goat judgment. There's a marriage supper. And then the big white, th- at the end of the thousand years is the big judgment, the great white throne judgment, after which there'll be a new heavens and a new earth. 
that'll be important news to our global warming advocates. Peter t explains how that's going to be quite warm. And, of course, after New Heavens and New Earth, we have the New Jerusalem introduced from, he uh, from heaven. So that's a quick s snapshot of the sequencing here, obviously not to scale. But one of the things that we are dealing with here is this whole idea of the millennium. That's what divides Christianity today because many denominations deny that as a literal reality. So eschatology, <clears throat> for your first, if you're studying uh, last things, your first divide in the road is between whether you believe a premillennial, that you believe in a literal millennium, or whether you don't think there's really a millennium. They call themselves even amillennialists. There, are, there used to be some that were post millennium They said we're already in the millennium. That was very popular up until the 20th century. In the 18th, 19th century, that was a, 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 rash, a, a view per, by some. But it's pretty clear after the 20th century is the bloodiest century in human history that uh, there aren't many people that hold that view exactly. There's a variation of our millennials called preterists, which believe that prophecy's already been fulfilled. We won't waste our time on that one. Or the reconstructions, those are deviants from those particular views. The main point I want to get across here your eschatology will derive from your hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is your theory of interpretation. If you take the Bible very literally, you'll be leaning over to the right side of that chart. If you're willing to allegorize, if you treat it just as poetry or just as uh, instructional tools or something, uh, allegorically, you're over on the left side. And your eschatology will derive from your theory of interpretation. Now, this whole idea of the rapture, many good scholars have different views here. But we hold that view because we notice that if you go through all the, the passages of the second coming, they have certain things in common. But there's a whole bunch of other passages that contradict those. There's two groups that are mutually contradictory. If you go through all of those, there's a couple, several dozen in each category, you discover in one case the rapture involves a translation of believers. Second coming, there's no translation involved. The translated saints go to heaven on the one hand, they return to the earth in the other. The earth is not judged in the one, the earth is judged in the second one. One is eminent at any moment. We can expect, we're taught again and again in the New Testament to expect him at any moment. That's the rapture. The second coming comes after a very detailed sequence of seven years of history that are laid out in, in surprising detail. The rapture isn't in the Old Testament. It's hinted at three places, but it's not expressed there. And, of course, it's very, the, the second coming is expressed in almost 2,000 places. So one, the rapture involves believers only. The second coming involves all the people on the earth. The rapture comes before the day of wrath. The second coming concludes the day of wrath. So in the rapture, there's no reference to Satan. In the second coming, Satan is bound. In the rapture, he comes for his own. In the second coming, he comes with his own. In the rapture, he comes in the air. Second coming, he comes to the earth, rather dramatically. Rapture, he claims his bride. In the second coming, he comes with his bride. Ooh, that's interesting. Something's occurring between those two then. And only his own shall see him in the rapture. Every eye shall see him in the second coming. The great tribulation begins after the rapture. And the second coming, the millennium begins. The rapture involves church believers only. The second coming apparently is the time that the Old Testament saints are raised. So we have different views of premillennialists as to whether or not the church goes through the tribulation. Again, you'll be leaning to the right side if you take things literally. Many people say pre-tribulation is a recent view. That's not true. It's historically it goes way, way back um, to the first century, actually. Irenaeus, Hippolytus, just Mar, Ephraim the Syrian. Uh, you can quote from his sermons. These are re re recent discoveries of very ancient texts. And we won't go through all this. Just understand there's always been a, a core group of premillennial, pre-trib believers. And uh, so the point I really want to get across here, though, is if you are, uh, many, many churches have a denominational the, the view that they're amillennial post-tribulational. And we're taking a view that we're premillennial, pre-tribulational. And, and, but the main point is that's because of our hermeneutics. We take the Bible very, very strictly. And, uh, and there are many good scholars that wouldn't join us in some of these views. So you just be aware of the fact that you've got to do your own study and come to your own conclusions. But so you, so you understand where we're coming from, you at least know why we're taking the views we have. All of us uh, uh, perceive that uh, imperfectly. We all have things to learn, and so uh, we want to always take our views cautiously. And, uh, but let's get back to this order of events. We have the rapture taking place, 
and uh, we have uh, down on earth we have all that going on the, uh, the the tribulation and the Armageddon and of course Christ uh, comes back to interrupt that and sets up his kingdom and there's the sheep and goat judgments there's also the strange period 12, 1290 and 1335 days that people have speculations about we'll just watch and see but uh, we have the sheep and goats, the marriage supper, and the great white throne after the thousand years, and new heavens and new earth, and new Jerusalem. The point is, the question is, what's going on in heaven? Everybody makes their little charts about what we know is going on on the earth. What we're going to do in the next session is explore what's going on in the mezzanine, if I can put it that way. You know, Paul says something very strange. He says, I keep my body and bring it under subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Wow. And what's he afraid of? If you read his writings, he's nervous all the time. He's, he's, he lives his life apprehensively. He's a, he, he, run, he runs the race. He's trying to win. He's, dry, dry, he's a high, high drive guy. I myself should be a castaway. What's he afraid of? Losing his salvation? Absolutely not. He wrote the book on eternal security. It's called Romans chapter 8. He's afraid of losing his inheritance, and that's what this is going to be talking about. I often make a remark that the, 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 uh, when I'm, there are a lot of Christians, most Christians, I think, when they get to heaven, will be disappointed because they've been all taught you're going to rule with Christ. It doesn't say that. There's always a footnote. For we are made partakers of Christ if, if we hold, partakers of metakoi, part participant, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. The big if there. That if doesn't, uh, what's at risk here is not our salvation, it's our, our inheritance is the point. And that's what we'll discover in the next time. Jesus says, Behold, I come quickly, hold, fast, hold, hold that fast, which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. So I want to put a challenge. I always want to finish my presentations with a challenge that if you accept the challenge, you flunk. If you accept this preposterous proposition, you flunk the course. You and I are moving into a period of time about which the Bible says more than any other period of time in history, including the time that Jesus walked the shores of Galilee and climbed the mountain of Judea. Now, that's preposterous. That the days ahead are more detailed in the Bible than even the gospel days were. So with that, let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for bringing us here. We thank you that we are right here by your divine appointment. We pray, Father, through your Holy Spirit and through your word, you will illuminate that path before us and let us know exactly what you would have of each of us in the days that remain. As we commit ourselves into your hands, in the name of our coming King, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.